Hello and welcome aboard, lads and lasses. Today, we will be continuing the Star League lore series. Previously, we had discussed mankind's ascendancy to the stars, along with the rise of the Terran Alliance from the ruination of the various world governments on Terra. Then, we explained how the Terran Alliance came to fall and collapse, withdrawing inward in a 30 light year radius around Terra, relinquishing control of hundreds of systems, leaving them to fend for themselves. The Terran Alliance eventually collapsing into civil war in which a man by the name of James McKenna would take action. Admiral McKenna would use his naval forces to strong arm the Alliance government to cede the executive control of their government to him. McKenna, upon gaining control of the situation, would now disband the Terran Alliance, installing his new administration in its place. They would soon become known as the Terran Hegemony from this point onward. In today's lore, we'll be talking about James McKenna's newly formed Terran hegemony, as well as the rise of the Camerons, whom of which would rule the Terran hegemony, and go about creating the Star League, till the treachery of Omeris. James McKenna, after seizing power over the Terran Alliance while still aboard his bridge of his warship, proclaims his new charter, the Hegemony Charter. Details how James intended for his new administration to run what was left of the Terran Alliance. The document details the disassembly of the previous government, replacing key positions such as planetary administration with what he called planetary governors. These planetary governors would be charged with ruling in the hegemony's name. Above these planetary governors would sit the head of state, an individual who is alleged to be bound to the wills of the people. James McKenna viewed himself as a man of the people. He saw himself as their dictatorial savior believing that he knew what was best for his people. He had a clear vision of what the people of the Alliance space should do to achieve greatness. To make this dream of greatness possible, he needed absolute power to do so. He held a public election in which people in a landslide elected him as their new dictator. At this point, it was hard for them to conceive how under McKenna's rulership, anything could get worse than it already was. James McKenna, after being elected the Director General and Lord Protector of the Terran Hegemony, a title essentially granting him a supreme executive power over the entirety of the nation, to the commoners and everyday citizens, the new government closely resembled the old Terran Alliance. This left quite a few people who had supported him initially disappointed. However, in the fine print, there was a small clause that made drastic change on how administration would be operated on a planetary scale. It allowed for an effective oligarchic-based system. Now, McKenna blamed the politicians for the failure of the Alliance, because most politicians lived in constant fear of their lives. Due to this, very few actually accomplished anything, which is one of the reasons as to why the Terran Alliance became stagnant and eventually collapsed from internal pressure. The Hegemony Charter also laid out how the planetary congresses would function and elect congress members. Congress members would be elected first on a two-year probationary period, a sort of trial, if you will, to allow each politician to work hard to prove themselves as best they can in a short period of time. After this period, if the people were not outraged by the performance, then they would act out the remaining six years of their term. Congress members could be impeached, but only if they were convicted in a court of law, and a referendum that the majority of the populace of said planet wished to depose them. If these requirements were met, then and only then could a congressman be impeached. It essentially made being elected rather difficult, but once elected, it made entrenchment of the new politicians very, very strong. McKenna extended their term time so that the congressmen, in theory, would focus more on their jobs rather than worrying about the next election. He had hoped that this would remedy some of the problems that the Alliance had faced with their own elected representatives, as they had in the past, which these similar grievances were what had escalated the Alliance to civil war in the first place. They had also deemed it necessary to ban every political party because they deemed the party system to be the root cause of corruption. In its place, they allowed politicians to form think tanks, allowing like-minded individuals to still organize, but not on the same level as the political parties of old. This made them unable to amass the same amount of wealth and clout as they had in the past. 
Electronic voting was also banned. The aim was to reduce voter fraud, as it was in the Alliance that votes meant virtually nothing to the common citizen. This stemmed from the various parties bankrolling voter fraud to gain seats of power in the old government. Once McKenna had finished stabilizing his new government for the time being, he set about unifying the various fractured worlds who had once been a part of the old Terran alliance. Though many would be joining willingly, few would require negotiations and extensive diplomacy to be brought back into the fold. Two worlds, however, would prove much more resistant to McKenna's vision. Altair and Kaf would require the newly formed hegemony to flex its military might, forcing them to submit to McKenna's will and be absorbed into the slowly expanding empire. McKenna, after reclaiming all the lost worlds of the Alliance within the 30 light year radius around Terra, thus re-establishing his hegemony from the remains of the former Terran Alliance, he then set about using his economic base to begin rapidly exporting cheap goods. The idea behind this was that the neighboring independent worlds were not developed well enough to quite survive their independence from the Alliance. By buying goods exported by the hegemony, that would gradually make them more dependent on those exports, thusly making them more dependent on McKenna's hegemony. While his plan saw some early gains, it did not quite work as McKenna had wished for. Many of the worlds bordering the hegemony were already self-reliant, having built up their industries after the Alliance had originally abandoned them. It also didn't help that McKenna made his plans very obvious. Often in his public speeches, he would proclaim his plans to unify mankind under a single banner, and often more cases than not, painting a devilish picture of any who would refute his, this ambition. That alone was probably more than enough to telegraph his true intentions. McKenna was a man of action, and he gave the colonies little time to properly ready themselves, as his navy would launch in preparations to bring unity to three worlds whom of which had recently formed a mutual defensive pact. This would be his first conquest campaign. The worlds in question were Quentin, Arai, and Helen. Now, historians suspect that the reason for these worlds in particular was that the three wealthy and prosperous societies offered a tremendous economic boon to the fledgling empire, one that McKenna needed desperately, and they were unwilling to join with the hegemony as if they knew their wealth would be sapped to rebuild the worlds within McKenna's empire. With what little time they had, and in great desperation, the three worlds retrofitted their cargo and messenger ships with lasers and missile batteries. They gave their best troops some of their most potent weapons and armor. They then called upon the peoples of their worlds to join volunteer divisions to fight for their freedom against the encroaching empire. The three colonies fought with bitter determination, their fanatical troops fighting with all their righteous fury against overwhelming numbers. In the end, the hegemony were able to crush their flotilla and lay waste to their divisions, but not before taking extensive casualties as the three worlds, while outnumbered and under-equipped, had managed to drag the war on for a whole year. The fighting was brutal, and it taught the hegemony that they would have to change their doctrines of war lest they suffer grueling casualties again in their future conquests. After their capitulation, the worlds were absorbed into the hegemony. McKenna, along with his command staff, would devise a new doctrine of pacifying planets, both to spare future hegemony soldiers and to speed the rate in which they could force a colony towards capitulation. The new doctrine of warfare would begin first with gathering intel and data on the planet's defenses, as well as any defensive fleets in the system. Once they had gathered all intel necessary, they would enter the planning phase, preparing their forces for engagement. Once the plan was set, the fleets would be dispatched to secure the system's jump points, isolating the system from the outside. This would secure a clear path for the dropships carrying the invasion forces to the system. Then, a group of warships would escort the dropships from the jump points to the planet. During McKenna's reign, he would usually lead his forces from the Black Lion, his personal battlecruiser. Once the planet's orbit was secured, reconnaissance patrols in low orbit were dispatched to verify previous intel gathering operations, which were generally out of date or incorrect, mapping the world for the ground forces. 
These patrols were usually escorted by warships to ensure their mission completion in case of any enemy preemptively striking the recon craft. The hegemony commanders would generally focus on three primary strategic points, population centers, industrial centers, as well as any water processing plants. Troop ships were dispatched in escorts with warships. Once they had reached their designated points, they would send out dropships, which would bring the various divisions and armies down to their objectives. Using these tactics, McKenna managed to pacify over 40 worlds. Some of the more notable conquests were Terra Firma, Capella, and Nanking, in which they managed to crush the plant's resistance in mere weeks. Despite the hegemony's massive armada, it was still, however, not designed for invasions. Their military lacked any proper aerospace fighters, meaning they had to choose to prioritize the space fighter beforehand and risk the dropships being overtaken by enemy air fighters, or take the air fighter and risk the ships in orbit. In summary, the hegemony lacked a universal fighter capable of performing in both the void as well as in the air, or in Battletech terms, an aerospace fighter. In addition to this, the hegemony also lacked overall specialized equipment for performing their invasion operations. Faced with the realities of the technology they had available, McKenna had to reevaluate his dreams for mankind unified under Terra. This was only expanded upon as the various alliances beyond the hegemony's controlled space began expanding. He started to see that even his military might could not overcome these larger alliances. Faced with this reality, McKenna starts to change the tone of his speeches, from those of reconquest to that of unity and harmony, that the hegemony was a bastion of knowledge and human compassion. He was attempting to shift the views of the many alliances that he was a man of peace and not a man of war. While McKenna actively pursued diplomatic interaction with the major alliances, he still sought conquest of the few remaining unaffiliated worlds. He believed them to be fair game, as none of them officially were absorbed or affiliated with the various packs and alliances, slowly growing outside the hegemony's borders. In the year 2335, he would launch his third campaign on the worlds he deemed vital to the hegemony's continued prosperity. His campaign was aimed in the direction of the Federation of Sky, what would become, one day, the Liran Commonwealth. The major focus of this campaign would come to two worlds, Galate and Surma. The two worlds were populated by people who viewed technology negatively. Think space Amish people, people who refuse to use technology and instead live in a regressed period of time. Now, how they got to these worlds, let's just say it's a bit hypocritical. But never mind that. The neighboring Federation of Sky had respected these people's wishes to pursue their own livelihoods unmolested. The reason why McKenna had targeted these worlds in particular was that they possessed great untapped resources, as well as being some of the few water-rich planets. Initially, McKenna's campaign saw great success, seizing many valuable worlds such as Denabella, Milton, Alioth, Mazar, and Lyons. After seeing through these great successes, the Director General would pass leadership of the invasion to his son, Admiral Conrad McKenna. As James McKenna, the Director General, his health was beginning to decline. He headed back home for Terra in the Black Lion. Conrad McKenna had a lot to prove and he had his father's charisma, which helped him gain the trust of his men early on. Once his father had left, Conrad McKenna proceeded to launch his first major operation against the world of Galate. Whether due to lack of experience or impatience or even overconfidence, Conrad ignored the previous combat doctrines established by his father. Due to his haste, he ordered the ground invasion prematurely, wanting a swift victory against the technologically inferior inhabitants of Galate. And he ignored his advisors about scouting the world before, sending in the ground troops. As expected, the ground forces with no clear objectives to force capitulation faced a difficult guerrilla insurgency. The inhabitants used old rocket launchers and slug thrower weapons. The problem being that, though old, the hegemony hardware was still outdated enough that the rockets were capable of tearing through their armor, 
even the slug throwing weapons pierce the hegemony marine armor as well. Due to this, the ground troops struggled to make headway. The natives' use of retrotech weapons, which combined with their guerrilla tactics, had turned what was supposed to be in Conrad McKenna's eye a swift victory into an utter slog. Despite being a slog, the hegemony was able to pacify Galate in a year. However, due to the grueling ground war that took place to Conrad McKenna's arrogance, many in the command staff began to cast serious doubts as to his leadership abilities. Conrad McKenna grew furious with the force commanders of the HAF, blaming the force commanders for the year-long pacification of Galate, turning what he believed should have been a swift pacification of a bunch of savages into a long, bloody conquest. While many of the lower officers would begin to question and even doubt Conrad's leadership, the naval high command still had faith that he would pull through on Surma. After the delay at Galate, Conrad was desperate to prove himself as good a leader as his father. He wanted still to believe that a swift victory would restore his name. But he believed he still had to one-up his father, whether out of jealousy or envy. Because of this, Conrad preceded the invasion of the Surma system by ignoring more of his father's doctrines. He would send the troop transports with the first wave, believing that much like Galate, the people of Surma would be technologically backwards. Not having any spacefaring vessels or vord based defenses for his fleet to be contested by. After Conrad revealed his plan to his command staff, they violently disagreed with his plan. Rebecca Danford, a general in the Hegemony Army, publicly branded Conrad a fool. Conrad would have her sent to the brig for her mockery of him. After sending one of his force commanders to the brig, Conrad orders his fleet to jump into the Surma system. Following his plan, the entire flotilla, including the transport ships, jump. Upon their arrival, the vessels of Conrad's fleet begin exploding, as they materialize directly into a minefield. Some ships even materializing with mines inside of them, causing catastrophic damage to his whole fleet. As these explosions tear his ships to pieces, the heat from the blasts trigger the sleeper missiles scattered throughout the jump zones. The weapons activate. Firing their engines, they screamed towards the wounded ships, impacting and striking the various ships that were damaged by the blast from the mines, even so far as targeting escape pods that fired off desperately attempting to flee the carnage. After the damage reports had come in, it was clear that the Hegemony invasion force had sustained massive damage and could not invade Surma. Of their 29 troop transports, only two remained. The larger warships were the luckier of the various ships. Due to their sheer size, they were able to withstand the mines and missiles. This would not be the end of the unraveling disaster, as McKenna's plan had called for the second wave of ships to jump into the same coordinates as the first. Many ships frantically attempted to escape the jump zones. Most of the remaining were able to break clear. However, a small number were not as lucky. As the next wave materialized, some of the ships and undetonated mines were jumped into. Six more vessels were destroyed in the ensuing chaos. It was not the natives of Surma who had placed the defenses at the jump points, as it would come out later. The Federation of Sky were the ones responsible for the mines and sleeper missiles. As it turns out, despite the improved relations between the Hegemony and the Federation, the Federation did not take kindly to the Hegemony's conquest of worlds within their sphere of influence. As it turns out, the capital world of the Federation was dangerously close to Surma, and allowing Surma to fall to the Hegemony was something that the Federation could not abide. When Conrad arrived with the second wave, his warship was able to come out unscathed from the disaster. Upon seeing the ruination of his fleet, he proceeded to lay the fault of the failure squarely at the feet of Vice Admiral Harris Cather. So enraged by the destruction of his fleet, he moved to hold a court-martial for the Vice Admiral amidst the wreckage of his invasion force. The court-martial would take three weeks. Admiral Conrad would act as the prosecutor and judge of the trial. Many crews secretly plotted that if the Vice Admiral were found guilty, they would mutiny against Conrad for the insanity of his persecution. A day before Conrad's trial's due date of the Vice Admiral, the Black Lion had entered the Surma system. 
James McKenna, upon hearing the news of the slaughter at Surma, wasted no time leaving Terra to see if the rumors of his son's ineptness were true. Upon seeing the madness of his son's actions, James would put an end to the farce trial. He would then set about stripping his son of all his rankings, apologizing in utter humiliation of his son's ineptitude to the entirety of the invasion force. James McKenna would now assume command of the remnant of the invasion force, and order them back to Terra, thusly ending his campaign of conquest. The Black Lion was the last ship to exit the Surma system. After the massacre at Surma, the people, army, and navy of the Hegemony were enraged. They demanded that Conrad pay for his ineptitude and be put on trial for the hundreds of thousands lost at Surma. James would refuse to allow for any prosecution to go forward against his son. This would only stoke the flames of discontent yet further. Some would even begin whispering for an outright coup d'etat. However, James McKenna would give one final speech. It was in this speech that the Director General accepted the shortcomings of his son's actions. He would not allow his son to be prosecuted, but he would resign as Director General instead. This speech would sway public support enough in his favor to respect his wishes, as he had stepped down as the dictatorial ruler of, Ter of the Terran hegemony. Ten days later, James McKenna would die, as it turns out what had forced him to retreat to Terra from his campaign was that he was dying from cancer. After James McKenna had passed, it fell to the High Counselors to find a successor. They wanted to find someone with ties to McKenna so that they could use James's legacy to ensure stability. There were two candidates that they had found that had some promise. The first was Graham Nellis, an excellent orator and a former Marine officer who was well decorated, as he had served in a few operations in McKenna's conquest campaigns. The second candidate was a young man named Michael Cameron. Michael Cameron was an enlisted man currently serving in the Army Reserves on Terra. Well, he was educated in the ways of science. Some people speculated that he might have had autism as he would often fixate himself on whatever project he was working on. He was also extremely determined. His passion for his work would inspire his colleagues and comrades to work harder and more cooperatively together. After the High Council could find no other suitable candidates, they would allow Graham and Cameron to run publicly against one another. Due to the restrictions placed on their campaigns, they had to sway the people in the debates as James McKenna had banned public advertising of political campaigns. To the surprise of the High Councillors, Michael's intellect would outshine the suave persona of Nellis. Winning over the people by his passionate speeches, Michael would ascend to the Director Generalship in a landslide election. He was sworn in on January 17, 2340. Michael Cameron would be the first in a long line of Camerons who would rule over the Terran hegemony until its final days. This concludes today's lore. However, there is one mildly humorous fact I'm sure you'll enjoy. Conrad McKenna would retreat to his England manor in which he turned into an old crazy cat man. He died alone along with his cats, whom of which, upon running out of food, desecrated his corpse. He may have escaped justice for his crimes, but rest easy knowing his soul is now burning in hell. Thanks for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen, and as always, have a glorious day. Take care.